and welcome to Trendlines, a podcast on global affairs brought to you by World Politics Review. I'm Elliot Waldman. Just a quick note before we get started that if you enjoy this conversation on Trendlines, you can get more of WPR's news and analysis directly in your inbox by registering for our free daily newsletter. You'll also get a code for a 25% discount off an annual subscription. To sign up, go to wpr.pub slash trendlines. That's wpr.pub slash trendlines. When the unpopular president of Mali, Ibrahim Boubacar Keita, was ousted by the country's military last month, it came as a relief to many Malians who had been protesting for months against Keita's government. The officers who led the coup d'etat promised to set up a transitional civilian government and eventually hold elections. Many demonstrators in the streets of Bamako, the capital, welcomed them as conquering heroes. Since then, things haven't quite gone as planned. Over the weekend, Mali's military junta released its transition plan following three days of talks with civilian opposition groups and civil society organizations, but the plan was promptly rejected by the coalition that led the anti-government protests, known as the M5 RFP, which denounced the plan as a power grab. Throughout the crisis in Mali, a key player has been the Economic Community of West African States, a regional bloc that comprises Mali and 14 other countries. ECOWAS, as it is known, has demanded that the transitional government in Mali be headed by a civilian, but the transition plan released by the junta does not preclude it from being led by a military officer. ECOWAS is holding a meeting this week on Tuesday to discuss how to proceed. Joining me now to talk about the situation in Mali and ECOWAS's role there is Alex Thurston. He's a longtime contributor to World Politics Review and an assistant professor of political science at the University of Cincinnati. He's got a forthcoming book called Jihadists of North Africa and the Sahel, scheduled for release this fall, and you can follow him on Twitter at Sahel Blog. Alex, welcome to Trendlines. Thanks so much for having me on. I thought it would be good to start with a little bit of background about ECOWAS. As its name suggests, when it was first founded in 1975, its primary goal was to promote economic integration and development in the region. So when and how did ECOWAS start to play more of an active role in politics and security as well? So there were some hints and moves fairly early on in its history that it's it considered its mandate to go well beyond uh, just you know economic affairs and trade. So as early as 1981, there was a defense protocol. And then really from the, the 1990s on with crises in Liberia and Sierra Leone and Guinea-Bissau and elsewhere, uh, the, the, the community, the, the ECOWAS community took a much more forceful role in, in you know, intervening directly in civil wars and rebellions in the region, uh, deploying a force called ECOMOG or the, the you know, ECOWAS monitoring group to Liberia, and then you know, continuing to play something of a, of a role um, either as a pressure group, you know, against uh, military rulers or, or by, you know, again, contributing peacekeepers and forces uh, through the 2000s and, and sort of episodically up to the present. As you hinted there, there have been quite a few crises that uh, ECOWAS was involved in mediating or trying to defuse. Um, and you've written for us in the past that really the organization's track record is mixed and highly dependent on the context of each case and all the different political factors involved. Based on those previous examples, what would you say are the conditions that allow ECOWAS to be an effective force for peace in the region? I think at the most cynical, I might say that the weaker and smaller the country that they're uh, confronting or, 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 you know, where there's a crisis, that the more successful they've been. So, I mean, maybe the most successful instance of intervention in their whole history actually came with Gambia in 2017 when the the president or the the you know now former president Yahya Jame had held an election had been defeated even by official results and then attempted to remain in power and, and ECOWAS you know in part through deploying a force uh, you know blocked him and and you know uh, ousted him basically prevented him from from overturning the election and I think part of that does have to do with the the, the weakness of you know Gambia a small you know poor country, even in the context of, of most other West African states. And, and I think it had to do with the you know personal unpopularity of, of Yahya Jame among his, his peers. Other instances have been a lot more mixed. I mean, I think the pressure from ECOWAS has, has contributed to 
restoring democracy in certain places, restoring civilian rule to to signaling to civilian leaders that are sorry, signaling to military rulers that they don't have sort of carte blanche to, to you know, do whatever they want. But that doesn't necessarily mean that ECOWAS can can impose outcomes on military regimes or, you know, civilian members. I mean, one example of that might be uh, a crisis in Niger between 2009 and 2011. So in 2009, the then president, Mamadou Tanja, had reached the end of his second term and and the constitution stipulated that a president could only serve two five-year terms. And so he engineered a referendum that gave him basically a third uh, micro term and, and plunged the country into a kind of constitutional crisis. And then ECOWAS suspended Niger. And then the Nigerian military stepped in in February of 2010 and overthrew him. And ECOWAS also rejected that move. So then you had a, a transition in, in Niger, about a 14-month transition back to an elected president. So on the one hand, I think ECOWAS pressure signaled to the Nigerian military that regional powers were watching closely, that there was going to be a lot of pressure on the country, that ECOWAS was not going to accept uh, a civilian president going for a third term against the constitution, but nor was it going to accept uh, a long-time you know, military junta. On the other hand, the military basically took its time. You know, 14 months is, is not insignificant in terms of them remaining in power. The Nigerian military had a history by that time of, of intervening and sort of trying to play the, the referee of democracy when it felt that civilian presidents were exceeding their, their powers or their mandates. So I think there's oftentimes uh, some limits to the power of ECOWAS, and, and they can't necessarily force actors in the region to immediately do what they want. Before we really talk in detail about what's going on right now in Mali, uh, it's good to mention that the current coup there is not the first time that ECOWAS has been involved. The organization intervened in 2012 when mutinying soldiers upset with the way the government was handling a rebellion in the north forced uh, then-President Amadou Toumani Touré from power. Could you talk a little bit about how ECOWAS handled the situation then in Mali and, and maybe whether there are some lessons to take from that experience for the current situation? Great question. Yeah. And and with the coup in Mali this year, that that past experience from 2012, the similarities, which are which are stark and real. I mean, the two the two coups apparently began as from everything that's been reported about each one. They both apparently began as mutinies in the same exact, you know, military town outside of the capital. Uh, but there's also profound differences between the two coups. And so in 2012, it was really kind of a classic junior officer's coup, you know, and and the face of the coup became a captain. And I think that that junta's relative amateurishness, their their lack of seniority, their lack of of savvy about how, you know, big-time politics was played – all that, I think, contributed to an outcome where, where ECOWAS and other actors pressured them to, to turn power over to civilians very quickly. I mean, basically within about three weeks. And after they handed over power, there were some, you know, rumors and, 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 and uh, concerns about whether they were exercising influence over the civilians and, and whether they had longtime ambitions. But basically in 2012, ECOWAS... Uh, put some real pressure on and, and got the outcome they wanted very quickly. This year, though, the officers who took power are mostly colonels. They have some, you know, generals either officially or unofficially kind of uh, aligned with them as well. They are very savvy about how to deal with Malian political actors and with the international scene. They seem to have a keen sense of where the red lines are and then what can be negotiated. And so already... You know, now it's been almost exactly a month since the this 2020 coup in Mali. Already, the new junta there um, has has shown that ECOWAS doesn't fully control what's what's going to happen, um, and it's playing out quite differently this year than it did in 2012. So, looking at the makeup of ECOWAS now, talk a little bit about who uh, or what are the key players that wield the most clout vis-a-vis the situation in Mali and. And also, how unified is ECOWAS right now in terms of the stance they want to take toward the junta? Uh, what are some of the competing priorities they're wrestling with as they as they try to uh, exercise influence? 
Yeah, these are really crucial questions. You know, one thing I should mention, actually, to go back to 2012, 2013, is is another way that you can see the limits of ECOWAS's influence is that in 2012, you had the coup in Bamako and, you know, against the, against the central government in Mali. You also had, very famously, as you know, the rebellion in the in the northern part of the country and then the jihadist takeover of of most of the north then you had for the second half of 2012 a de facto partition of the country and a lot of scrambling basically and and uh, you know uh, agonizing over what to do and there were and ECOWAS had a major role in that and and there were sort of very slow movements toward a efforts to negotiate with some of the kind of you know, jihadist light figures, but then also there was talk of an ECOWAS-led intervention, and that moved very, very slowly through the second half of 2012. And then you had then in January 2013, the jihadists in the north, some of them advanced into the center part of the country, changed the dynamic, you know, almost overnight, and then France intervened and, and with, you know, Chadian and other support. But one thing it highlights again is, is that, you know, ECOWAS is hesitant to make really big moves like that, you know, really big military interventions and, and uh, you know, really kind of dramatic, uh, again, yeah, interventions in, in other countries' politics. And and so, you know, comparing what happened in Mali in 2012 with what happened in Gambia in 2017, the Gambia situation starts to seem like more of more of an outlier and that some some hesitancy on the part of ECOWAS, especially about military intervention, is, is more the norm recently. Going back to your question then about key players within Mali in terms of ECOWAS. You have, uh, for for the first half of this year, uh, Mohamedou Isifu, the president of Niger, was the chairman of ECOWAS. It's a it's an annual rotating position. Now it's the it's the president of Ghana, um, Akufo Adu. Um, so you have, uh, obviously you have Mali's neighbors that are very, very interested. Um, Senegal, Niger, Burkina Faso, Mauritania is no longer a member of ECOWAS. I think they left in in 2000, if memory serves. But they work with ECOWAS sometimes. And so Mauritania's role shouldn't be discounted. Beyond the immediate neighbors, Ghana, as I mentioned, and then also Nigeria, which is generally considered the the heavyweight within ECOWAS in terms of funding, in terms of the headquarters of ECOWAS is in Abuja, the capital of, of Nigeria, and in terms of politics, in terms of Military deployments, you know, often the, the bulk of the soldiers have come or would be expected to come from Nigeria. So a past president of Nigeria, the, the immediate past president, good luck, Jonathan, is the ECOWAS mediator and has been to Bamako, you know, a number of times, both both in the context of the protests before Keita fell and then following the coup has been there as well. And then the current president of Nigeria, the actual president of Nigeria, Mohamedou Buhari, uh, is also, you know, a, a major player within ECOWAS and therefore a major player vis-a-vis the, the Mali crisis. I think then you do have some key divisions or maybe we could say tensions within ECOWAS. One, one concern or one source of tension is third term bids by uh, two, you know, prominent leaders within ECOWAS. So Alassane Ouattara of Cote d'Ivoire and then Alpha Conde of Guinea, both of whom are pursuing third terms right now, you know, in in uh, ways that at the very least sit uneasily with, with their own constitutions and with the kinds of uh, democratic norms that ECOWAS wants to impose or, or to, to establish within the region. And Buhari himself, you know, at, at one of the recent ECOWAS meetings, alluded to this. He didn't call out Watara and Conde by by name, but he he pointed to what he sees as, as the destabilizing effects of third term bids. You also have in in uh, Togo, you know, the, the Nyasingbe family has been in power since 1967. So it gets complicated after a while for ECOWAS, at least as a collective, to point fingers at other actors and say you're not being democratic when 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 they in so doing expose themselves to to charges of hypocrisy you mentioned how ECOWAS has been hesitant to make any big uh, military interventions in the region it seems like in Mali in response to last month's coup they've been leaning more heavily on uh, economic options so 
uh, ECOWAS announced it would close international borders uh, between Mali and its other members and, and also curb financial transactions. What kind of impact do we see these measures having on the Malian economy already? Yeah, I think this is the the main source of leverage that they've used, and it's a serious one. I mean, you know, and I, I'd be I'd be amazed if there was any kind of military intervention at this point or or in the medium term. But but the financial and economic you know penalties that they've imposed are definitely serious. There's a sense that they could have gone further. I mean, the the press coverage from RFI and and you know elsewhere in the francophone press has suggested that they really could have you know, brought the Malian banking system to its knees and, and therefore brought the economy to its knees. But and they, they didn't, you know, they didn't go sort of the full, uh, the full extent that they could have. But even what they've done, I mean, closing borders, uh, you know, freezing and suspending certain types of, of financial transactions. Yeah, it's had a big impact. And it comes in the context of, or, or it comes on the heels of the economic impacts of COVID-19. And just a few weeks before the coup, was when several Sahelian countries, including Mali, were just beginning to reopen, you know, air travel and and to think about, you know, easing restrictions at, at the land borders and so forth. One issue among COVID-19 and amid the current restrictions, though, is these are the classic kind of porous borders, right? And there were studies by NGOs and other observers during COVID, you know, suggesting that uh, people were still crossing the borders, that you know, people would, would go around the checkpoints or that bribes would be paid and so forth. So there is there is an issue of enforcement. But even so, even if it's only partially enforced, it still has a big impact. I mean, during, during COVID-19, during the restrictions, you know, people were, uh, journalists and others were saying that, for example, food transport companies were having major issues with, uh, you know, produce rotting in trucks and herders, you know, pastoralists who, who are accustomed to crossing back and forth, you know, between borders were, were having, you know, severe impacts. So yeah, there's a lot of impacts, even of partial border, border closures and, and partial financial restrictions on, on ordinary people. You and I are speaking on Tuesday, which is also the day when uh, ECOWAS is having a meeting to discuss further steps it might take in Mali. Do you think we might see a tightening of sanctions or, or even more forceful steps along the lines of what you just talked about, uh, given that the junta's uh, proposed transition framework does not really align with what ECOWAS wants to see? Yeah, the, the press coverage that I've seen coming out of today's meeting in Accra suggests that ECOWAS, that neither side has blinked, to put it that way, I guess, you know, that, that, but that ECOWAS is still in particular insisting that there be civilian leadership for whatever transitional government comes next, but that ECOWAS hasn't necessarily spelled out exactly what the consequences will be if that's not met, if, if the junta doesn't defer to that. And I think ECOWAS is in, they're in a tough position because you know, they're, I think they're aware and, and international actors are aware uh, as a whole that, that you know, ramping up economic sanctions could have even more devastating effects for, for ordinary people. I mean, that's been an issue with sanctions around the world, obviously, is that sometimes it's, it's the ordinary people who suffer the most. I think ECOWAS also, you know, I don't know. I mean, maybe this is going too far, but I mean, if I had to make a prediction, I, I think that ECOWAS is more likely to blink than, than the Junta is because I think the Junta are, you know, aware that they, they hold more cards at the end of the day. I mean, I don't think that ECOWAS really wants to um, send in a military force. I think that would be an extremely dramatic and, and unpredictable and destabilizing move, you know, and, and a lot of, you know, France and ECOWAS and others, they don't want to see all the myriad problems in Mali get even worse. And then I think the sanctions have, you know, the downsides that I mentioned of potentially affecting ordinary people. And I think that, you know, maybe the junta knows that. And I think ECOWAS has, you know, at several points sort of used the negotiating technique of, of threatening sanctions in a fairly vague way. And that I think maybe has also implicitly kind of undermined their position a little bit. You know, I, th- I think the junta may feel that, yeah, in a game of chicken that, that, ECOWAS will swerve first. It does feel like the the junta has been dictating terms, at least as far as its negotiations with the uh, the protest leaders, the M5 RFP, are concerned. What needs to happen in Mali, really, for the uh, civilian protest leaders to have more of a voice in the process going forward? That's a great question. And there's so many tricky issues at play. For one thing, there's the question of who they represent in the in the first place. So there's no question that they were able to turn out 
what seemed like tens of thousands of people this summer for protests. I mean, if you look at the the aerial footage, you know, the photographs, I mean, the, the crowds that they turned out were, were unbelievably large. On the other hand, they seem to have had relatively limited resonance beyond Bamako. And in fact, a lot of what's happened this summer, you know, arguably in some sense, the coup itself is, is part of, you know, Bamako politics. I mean, not that it doesn't have effects elsewhere, but, but you know, the extent to which any actor in Bamako really speaks for, for Malians generally, that's, that's up for real debate. Then too, you have divisions within, within the M5 RFP. So you have leaders even publicly contradicting one another, leaders sort of waffling and, and seeming to not know exactly what they want, and, and including vis-a-vis the, the junta, the, the CNSP. So I think that that makes it difficult. Obviously, the, the, the M5 RFP represents a sizable major political force, but I think that the, the sort of um, lack of unanimity makes it a little bit difficult for them to, to act as, as a decisive pressure group against the junta. Even the uh, very charismatic uh, imam who was helping lead the protests, uh, Mahmoud Diko, I believe, has uh, even has now withdrawn from the protest movement, right? It's so hard to tell. I mean, it feels like, you know, it feels like it, it shifts on almost a day-to-day basis. I mean, you know, and, and there are even there even seem to be sometimes uh, instances of daylight between Diko and, and uh, Isa Kao and Jim, who's his, his uh, main sort of spokesman and, and the leader of, of the movement called CMAS, which is the, um, you know, movements and, and associations and sympathizers of, of Diko, basically. So when there's daylight between him and, and sort of his own spokesman, it, it gets really hard to, to suss out Diko's intentions. You know, he said that he, he, he intends now to go back to the mosque, but then he's clearly very still implicated and involved in politics. So it, the situation seems really fluid to me. And then on top of that, you have the security crisis, which uh, you mentioned earlier, and uh, the French forces are still there uh, in this part of this coalition that's uh, trying to tamp down uh, the jihadist forces in the region. You've got affiliates of uh, Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State uh, fighting various government forces and also fighting among each other. What are the stakes for France and uh, as well as the U.S. and other international actors as they're looking at what's going on in Mali? What are what are what kind of outcome are they hoping for here? I think in part they don't know. I think that France has has broadly envisioned a scenario where its forces will continue to decapitate terrorist movements, jihadist movements, where where the French will eliminate key leaders until the point where the movements become weakened. And then meanwhile, France will be building up other institutions, you know, the, the Malian and the Sahelian states, the G5 Sahel Joint Force, you know, whoever it may be, the, the you know, more recent Takuba Task Force, which is basically a bunch of European special forces. I think the French hope that, that they'll, they'll weaken the jihadist ranks and then they'll build up these other institutions and then eventually they'll be able to hand off responsibility for Mali and the Sahel to to some other institution, the the hole in that entire theory of change, though, is that those other institutions don't ever meet French expectations. So you know the the G five Sahel Joint Force, you know, since it was really uh, ramped up in twenty seventeen, has has not demonstrated any possibility of taking over the French security role in the region. Um, the the Malian and other states you know, obviously remain very weak as, as the coup, you know, underscores and highlights. And then the strategy of decapitation itself hasn't generated the results, I think, that the French would have liked. I mean, they've claimed major successes. I mean, in, in a way, I think they've, they've claimed as many, you know, successes against top targets as, as one could reasonably expect. I mean, they, you know, in June, they, they killed the entire leader, the, the overall leader of uh, Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb or AQIM, somebody who had been sought by, you know, security forces of various countries since since 2004 or earlier. So, you know, you can't ask for much more than that, I think, on, on you know, in terms of what's realistic. But then the violence gets worse, you know, and, and the jihadists seem to become more tenacious, more embedded in politics, um, recruiting more broadly among different kinds of communities and groups. And so, you know, even the core... Uh, counterterrorism strategy, the core "quote unquote" kinetic strategy at, at the heart of French thinking, you know, is is uh, it's really debatable whether it's whether it's working at all. 
I've read a lot from uh, analysts and other voices in the region who are arguing that, you know, this is really a time to re-examine the whole security-focused, uh, overly militarized strategy of France and other Western powers in the Sahel, and that all of this does very little to actually address the root causes of conflict, uh, and that there needs to be more of an emphasis on uh, social development, uh, economic opportunities for people in the region. Is there any sign that that, that kind of thinking is taking root in uh, Western capitals? So I, I agree fully with the the line of analysis that you laid out. And yeah, I read I read the same thing and talk to colleagues who say the same thing. And I think it's exactly right. And, and then to your question, no, I mean, I don't I don't think that that analysis is really, you know, when the chips are down taken seriously. I mean, I think I think probably anybody that you talk to within, you know, the, the French or American governments would say, no, there's no purely military solution to this. Yes, there needs to be you know, the, the return of the state is the, the phrase that the French use a lot. Um, you know, the, the American government would probably talk about, I don't know, you know, security governance or some kind of, you know, phrase like that. I mean, so, so I think people, you know, will rhetorically say, oh, yes, we think that there needs to be a broader political, you know, and development strategy. But I think when you look at the actions of, of different international powers, you know, particularly France and the United States, I think that their actions speak to the ways that, counterterrorism, quote unquote, kinetic action is the the overall priority. And and how, you know, I don't think that they've really come up with a solution for for what something like, again, the, the return of the state would actually mean. In various places in Mali, the state was never really that strongly present in the first place. In other places, state agents were part of laying the, the groundwork for what became this crisis. Corrupt judges, corrupt, you know, police and gendarmes and so forth, um, you know, a, a sense that uh, state agents in different places were captured by, you know, local oligarchies and so forth. So, you know, the, the return of the state is not going to be sort of a simple proposition of just, you know, building schools and court ho- courthouses and, and police stations in different parts of the country you would really have to win over civilians' trust in, in a serious way. And then you have just rampant security force abuses, um, you know, by by the Sahelian, you know, militaries. And, and that, of course, you know, further, um, A, you know, it makes it makes military counterterrorism operations harder to carry out. And B, it, it, it makes that uh, ambition about, return the return of the state or security governance or whatever you want to call it it makes all that that much more difficult to achieve no one likes to predict the future obviously but if you had to outline the likeliest scenario or scenarios alex for how the situation in mali will play out uh, over the next few months or even medium to long term what would that be to go back to one of the earlier answers i i do think that if it comes to a game of chicken that that ECOWAS would swerve first that that if the the junta insists on having one of its own or some other military officer head the transition, then I think that will happen. And that ultimately ECOWAS would, would accept that. I mean, not obviously, you know, explicitly, but, but they would, they would live with it because I don't think they would, you know, want to pay the costs of, of uh, really pushing back against that. Of course, that could mean that, you know, serious sanctions stay in place for the duration of the transition. But I think if, if the junta, the the CNSP, really wants to push for for having an officer in charge of the transition, then I think that that's what will happen. And I think that they're, you know, they have enough support. I mean, at least if we're talking about within Bamako, you know, they have enough support from ordinary people, from members of the political class, from journalists and commentators and so forth. I mean, I think they have enough local support, and that gives them a, a wedge or you know a tool to use against against ECOWAS pressure. So. I don't think the junta will stay in power forever. I mean, I'd be I'd be really surprised if they tried to push past the 18 months that seems to be the kind of consensus among everybody about roughly how long the transition will last. I'd even be surprised if the junta tries to run one of its own in whatever elections come next. Although I wouldn't rule that out from happening. And yeah, I think that you know, fundamentally uh nothing much is going to change here. I mean, that's that's really pessimistic and, and grim to say about a country with so many problems uh, as Mali has. But, you know, a lot of people have noted that Malians seem to be disgusted with what's called the political class as a whole. 
and to feel that the same figures have been kind of playing games of musical chairs since the 1990s. But it seems highly likely that one of those familiar faces will win the elections whenever they're held, you know, 2021, 2022. And then if that person comes into office with, you know, a relatively limited imagination, with already some cynicism among the citizenry about, you know, their capabilities and and their, uh, you know, level of personal integrity. And then if they inherit all the same problems, um, then it does seem to, to, you know, set up a, a, a sort of a bleak and cyclical future. A pessimistic prediction, but a realistic one, given what we've seen across uh, not only the Sahel, but also North Africa. I mean, what you're saying seems very familiar. The popular indignation with uh, the elite class, the revolving door of leaders who just cycle in and out uh, with nothing ever changing about the fundamental reality on the ground. Yeah, I mean, you know, the the um, American analyst Leslie Warner, whom I really respect, you know, she put it in a, in a funny way, but but in a very accurate way, you know, it was just sort of, all right, bro, I'll see you next coup, you know, and hopefully it won't be, you know, hopefully it won't come to that. But I mean, she she put it in about the most succinct way that that one can. And, and uh, it's hard. It's hard to argue with that kind of prediction at this point. Alex, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Really appreciated being on and, and all the great questions you asked. Alex Thurston is a WPR contributor and an assistant professor of political science at the University of Cincinnati, specializing in the study of religion and politics in the Sahel region and the Horn of Africa. You can follow him on Twitter at Sahel Blog. If you'd like to comment on the discussion, ask a question, or even suggest a topic for a future episode, drop us a line at podcast at worldpoliticsreview.com. This episode of Trendlines was produced by me, Elliot Waldman, and edited by Peter Dury. You can follow us on Twitter. My handle is at Elliot Waldman. That's two L's, one T. Peter is at P-E-T-E-R-D-O-E-R-R-I-E. Thanks for listening and tune in again next week.